by person or persons unknown, was officially put into the mill. This is the story of the information gathered by the narcotic squad and incorporated in that file. You know Miss Ames. Hello. This is Mr. Regan. Pleasure. How do you do? Pull up a chair. As we all know, Regan was sent here to replace Carter. And for your information, get lost. You'll be in the field strictly on your own. No contact. And we won't try to reach you. Phone calls only in an emergency. Miss Ames here also works on the outside. But her job is strictly with juvenile. Right now, she's employed as a car hop in a drive-in restaurant. You'll have that address. She'll be a connection with headquarters. Any messages or reports you make are through her. Anderson here works with the regular police and reports to me. It took Carter six months to get his first break. Now we're going to have to start from scratch. Organized narcotic traffic is big business. And to get to the top, you've got to go to the bottom. That's what Carter did when he went where the junk sells best, to school kids. The coach come with you, Anderson? I just picked him up over at the high school. Betty's typing an info file on him. Ray, you and Miss Ames step in the other office and take this down. Would you send Mr. Bet to end now, please? Would you step into the office, please? Lieutenant Lacey's waiting. Thank you. Mr. Gutger, this is Lieutenant Lacey. How do you do, Lieutenant? I'm glad to know you. Pleasure. Anderson here tells me that you have reason to suspect narcotic traffic in your school. Is that right? Well, I'm not sure. But I thought I should ask a few questions, know a little more about the subject. Well, this student you discussed with uh, Anderson, what are the indications that you noticed? This boy's name is Ray Bowman. And one of the other students in a hygiene class I hold told me that Bowman carried a hypodermic syringe. He told this boy he had sugar diabetes. Now, I don't know how this could be. All the students are supposed to have a physical report from their family physician before they participate in team sports. Well, I'd be bound to know about something like that. This boy participates in sports? He did. Football? Baseball? Both. Why did he quit? He just seemed to lose interest. He, he claimed he was allergic. He got nauseated a couple of times during practice, nose and eyes running. Finally got so sick last Wednesday, we sent him home. Is he still ill? I don't know. Nobody's seen him since. He didn't go home. <laughs> Edgar. Hey, this is Lieutenant Lacey and Sergeant Anderson. They want to talk to you about Ray. How do you do? Won't you come in, please? Thank you. There's a few questions I'd like to ask you, Mrs. Bowman. How long has it been since you've seen your son? Oh, he's not my son. He's my nephew. Oh. I last saw him a week ago Wednesday. Weren't you worried when he didn't show up? Not at first. You see, I was out of town on business most of last week. I thought maybe he stayed over with a friend. Ray does that sometimes. Then on Friday, the school nurse called and said he'd been sick and asked how he was. Weren't you worried then? Yes. What did you do about it? I called Mr. Bedker. Are you aware that your nephew may be in serious trouble, Mrs. Bowman? Well, I hardly think it's anything as grave as all that, Mr. Lacey. 
Frey has always been a well-disciplined boy. I feel sure that he's perfectly capable of using proper judgment. I understand that you and Mr. Bowman are separated, is that right? You misunderstand correctly, Mr. Lacey. Mr. Bowman passed away a little over a year ago. Raymond is his sister's child. Oh, I'm sorry. You're his guardian. Yes, I am. Now, I'm quite sure that Raymond is just up to some innocent prank that has perhaps grown out of proper proportion. That's exactly why I called Mr. Bedker, and certainly... Oh, excuse me, please. Hello? Oh, I'm so sorry, Dorothy. Are all the members there? Well, I'm afraid I'll be detained for a few minutes. It seems that Raymond is up to some boyish shenanigans. One of his teachers is here. I'll be there. You can handle it, I know. Yes, that's right. Goodbye. We won't delay you any longer. I'm sorry to appear rude, and I am most concerned about Raymond. But I'm supposed to be speaking at the women's club right now. Well, we have to ask you a few more questions to fill out our report. Perhaps we could do it by phone. Oh, could you? It would make it so much more convenient. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mrs. Bowman. Goodbye. <laughs> As a result of questioning Mrs. Bowman, we questioned many other people. Bowman's friends, the people he knew. Mostly direct questions concerning narcotics. We went the places Bowman went and did the things he did. We kept picking up little scraps of information. Always we asked the same question. Do you know Ray Bowman? Where did you see him last? among adolescents has become appalling in recent years. By October of 1951, the number of arrests of young drug addicts was nearly 20 times that of aren't you? Yeah. I'm new here. I just came over from the east side last Monday. Oh, hi. Bob Dewey said you work in the station at Maple and Canal. Could I have a ride? Come on, hop in. But you'll have to hurry because I'm almost late. Oh, well, so am I. I have to meet a friend. that I could give you a ride. Well, I come down here about twice a week. Oh, swell, any time. You know, I, I bet that you'll like it better over at school after you know some of the kids. Hey, by the way, I'm having a bunch over at the house Friday after the game. Could you come? You know, it'd give you a chance to get acquainted. Oh, gee, thanks, Dick. But I'm afraid those kids will probably think that I'm a square. Oh, I don't see that. Good get along fine. Well, thanks, anyway. I'd really like to, but I'm afraid I can't make it. Uh-oh. There's my friend. Later. Bye. Hey, wait. What's your name? Judy Bond. Take your time, sweetheart. I got all of them. One of the names on the list of people we were able to connect with Ray Bowman was that of a girl. Her name was Julie Barnes. Julie Barnes was important because she was the only girl suspect. Everyone on that list of Bowman's acquaintances was a suspect. A suspect because we now had every reason to believe that Raymond Bowman, age 17, whereabouts unknown, was a confirmed heroin addict.
Good afternoon, sir. Would you like a menu? No, thanks. I think I'll have a cup of coffee. Two, please. Thank you. The barn school was in about a quarter past one. This man, Jimmy, picked her up. 50 olds, 88 convertibles. License number 97209. Two other fellows talked to her up until about five minutes before he arrived. Young boys. Wendy and Dandy. Denim's and a t-shirt. That'll be ten cents, sir. Yeah, thanks. And a suitable tip. Young lady, am I being panhandled? No. But tipping is customary, and your orders were to be inconspicuous. And since tipping is the general procedure around here, I think you should comply. All right. How much? Well, I usually get a dime, but a 25-cent donation isn't uncommon. Ten cents ought to make it look pretty normal. You stake Anderson. He'll be around to pay you up about ten tonight. Oh, tell him not to bother. Regan called. He wants to talk to me tonight. It's been a pleasure serving you, sir. Does Anderson always pick you up after work? It's part of his job. I don't think he likes it. Sounds like grounds to me. Let's see if we can have him committed. He'll tell you himself he's crazy. Says it's required to be on the force. Oh, I guess it helps with that. Mm -hmm. I've been dropping a few hints over on South Southern Street. And uh, looks like I'm just about ready to get in a small-time junkie racket. Of course, it'll take a few dollars well marked to swing the deal. Incidentally, that's one of the minor reasons I want to see you tonight. How much money will you need? Is it something big? Oh, no, I'm just getting started. It's uh, one of those two-bit deals, you know. hundred, hundred and fifty dollars is plenty. And ask Lieutenant Lacey if he can make it something under ten, okay? Fine. Uh, what are you doing tomorrow night? Bringing money here for you. Pretty cotton-picking clever of me, huh? What do you think you're trying to pull? Get this straight. Nobody owns me. When you buy me dinner, you buy me dinner, and that's all, see? Look, Tramp, don't give me any of that now we will, now we won't routine, because I'm just about to become unglued and slap you up one side this lot and down the other. Oh, no, you won't, you jerk. Because right behind you is a car full of rag pickers. You make the big scene with me, and I'll let them know what you've got stashed under the front seat. Clear down to the end of the block. Shut up. Play it cool and get in that car. Who needs it? You're the one that's hot. Go on, big man. Hop in your short and make it someplace else before I change my mind. I could really get my kick seeing you get busted. I'm not going to forget this. You'd better, Dad. I'm jailbait, remember? Get on it before I decide to scream, you jerk. I told the wife I'd get home early and watch TV. Oh, sure, Ross. No problem. Good deal, kid. See you tomorrow. And uh, don't forget to cut the lights in the restroom. Okay. Hello, heart service. Yes, this is Dick. Oh, hi, Julie. Why, well, sure we fixed flat, but you have to bring it in. <laughs> no kidding. Well, yeah, I guess that I could, but well, I don't close up here for another 15 minutes. Oh, don't worry about that. I'll, I'll be there in high gear. Oh, no, don't be silly. I'm glad you called. Now, now what's the address? Okay, got it. Thanks. Dick? 
Mike? Yeah. Julie asked me to watch for you. She's inside. You can leave your car here if you want. Come on in. Oh, swell. Thanks. Hi, Julie. Hi, Dick. Did you wait long? No. I phoned the wave down the street, and then it took a while to walk over. Well, where'd you leave the car? Oh, gee, Dick, I tried to call you back, but you'd already left. A friend of mine bought a spare and took the car to get it fixed. But I still need a ride home. I thought maybe you could. Oh, sure. I'd love to. You know, you're nicer than I thought, Dick. What kind of a character did you think I was? Oh, I didn't think anything bad. I just figured that, well, that, that you were sort of a snob. Gee whiz. Me? Oh, I'm sorry. But you are, in a way. Well, I don't see how you could feel that way, Julie. Oh, I know you don't. But you're not from the east side. Well, what's that got to do with it? Didn't I invite you to a party at my house? Well, there's a lot of nice kids on the east side. Well, sure, I guess that there are. You still don't know how I feel. It's just that... Well, that you're so popular. Well, I still don't see what that's... Well, Dick, I'll bet that you're even ashamed to tell your friends that you took me out. Why? Sure. You invite me to come to your house. But I guess you want me to come alone. <laughs> Julie, why... Your mind's all warped and been out of shape. Why don't you introduce me to some of your friends? I'd probably like them fine. <sighs> And so the only way to combat this problem is that we learn the facts about the dangers of narcotics. And by we, I mean the parents, you faculty members, and the students themselves. Mr. Betka, don't you think that the advisability of this step should be considered before we expose our young people to the sordid aspects of this vice unnecessarily? Considered? Well, yes, Mrs. Bowman. But unfortunately, I have facts and figures which indicate that students and other young people from coast to coast have a working knowledge of the illegal use of narcotics, far in advance of their parents and teachers. What do you propose that we do about this, Mr. Betker? Well, I see it this way. How many of us really know the symptoms of narcotic addiction? I sure didn't, but I do now. Running nose, sensitive stomach, frequent yawning, loss of weight. I think we should know the facts. For the same reason they vaccinate for smallpox, to combat it. Your views are certainly interesting, Mr. Betker. However, I don't feel that the PTA is in a position to make a decision on this subject one way or the other. It seems to me that this is more of a problem of law enforcement, not one of education. Well, I think it's both, Mrs. Bowman. And I suggest that adults find out what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, that's ten you owe me. Yeah, but... Look, the best thing for you to do is forget about that ten dollars and consider yourself lucky. I'm going to pack in for a while and cool off. Look, 
I can't make it someplace else. I'm closed out. No credit. I've got a typewriter. What do you think I am, a pawn shop? Turn it into cash. Now blow out of here. Jimmy, you've got to fix me. Just this once. The cops are parked in front of my place, and they're going to twist me. So don't tell me your troubles. Oh, Jimmy, you've got to do something. You got me started. Please, you don't know how it is. Wait a minute. You better forget this I got you started routine while you're still walking around. You got yourself hooked, and I've been doing you a favor. Look, Jimmy, I don't want any trouble, but don't cut me off. I can't stand it. I'll take you with me. I'm warning you. Don't uh, put me down. Shut up. I'll get some money like the other guy. Why don't you give me a break? As soon as the cops are up, I'll crash the house. My mother's got some jewelry. I'll give it to you. It's worth plenty. Please. I'm getting jumpy. I don't know what I'll do if I don't get sick. Suppose I give you one cap now. And tomorrow you come up to the place, and I'll give you enough to last while I'm packed in, okay? Yeah, sure. Nothing the matter with that. Thanks. That's okay. Your credit's good. It's just that cops worry me, that's all. The best thing for you to do is hold up in a knee side pad with enough stuff. Right now I'm out. So you wait here and I'll go out and get a cap. Okay? Yeah, sure. That's okay. I've got $2.40. That's all right. You can pay me later when you get cooled off. Yeah, I'm kind of beat. I don't feel so good. Oh, well, I beat you the most. This place is a drag. Why don't we make it over to Jack's pad and come on real strong? Well, I'd, I'd let you go on me, man. I'm just getting by. Yeah, later on that. I'm okay. Wait, Jimmy. Yeah. I thought you said you had a dance. We just did. Well, why don't you go dance some more? The band's not playing. Well, I bet if you ask them real nice, they'd do anything for you, Julie. What do you mean? I said I think you ought to be dancing. Come on, let's dance. You've never been the same We walked into the nightclub And the whole band knew my name Baby, baby, baby Have yourself a day But just remember, baby That you are mine, oh mine You went away and left me you left me feeling blue If you'll come back, my baby Why, I'll be so true to you Baby, baby, baby Have you yourself a time Some of the boys were running down the files on the list of names Miss Ames brought in They found one with an old arrest warrant out Issued for overtime parking. They picked him up. They're running a make on him downstairs. If he's clean, he pays ten bucks to traffic violation, and we turn him loose. But as long as we've got him, we might as well talk to him, right? Yep. Anything on Julie Barnes and this fellow Jimmy she runs around with? No. Nope. Funny thing. Miss Ames says most of these kids know this guy to speak to, at least. But they don't seem to know anything about him. Yeah, they uh, say he doesn't seem to work any place either. You think he's our guy? No. Uh -huh. But the amount of stuff these guys have been packing around would take more money than he could scrape up if he sold it to every school kid in town. Might as well keep an eye on him, though. He may be a peddler or possibly a user or, more important, he may be somebody's pawn. But we want the big guy. 
But, like I say, keep an eye on it. Yeah, I want to talk to him. Let's go ask some questions. Mike, why'd you bust me? I'm clean, see? Where's Ray Bowman? I never heard of the cat. Let's see your arm. Like I don't make that scene. I'll put it down. You got nothing on me. Sure you did, son. Where do you live? I make it with a couple of cats. What's the address? Mike, they got a couple of pads. We can hold you for 72 hours. Look, don't come on that way. I just like to play. Have a ball, big. Now you listen to me, son. We don't intend to play with you. Guys like you keep us working overtime. Now you tell us the answers and we let you go. Otherwise, you can sit and think it over until tomorrow morning. Now speak up before I lose my temper. Are you going to talk or do you want to sweat? Go on, get out of here. Ray Bowman's been located on the east side. He's dead. self-administered, or a hot shot, also probably self-injected. I'd estimate the time at about 12 hours, probably strychnine. Tell you after the autopsy. You mean he was poisoned? It's an old custom. Explain it, Anderson. Whenever the supply or pushers get word that the authorities are about to close in on a user, they pass the word back along the grapevine. And if the addict isn't trusted, and very few are, or the higher-ups feel that he knows too much, they make sure that his next fix is his last one. Sometimes when they don't get the addict, they get the law enforcement men. Whatever way you take it, dope is murder. Mr. Betka identified your nephew. Why did he do it? Why? Why? I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Bowman. Let me take you home. investigation department is a little different than the run-of-the-mill police unit. Sometimes the job kind of gets on your nerves. Narcotics men work whenever there's work to be done. Sometimes we work an eight-hour day like the boys in the city hall. But lots of times we watch the sun come up over a cup of coffee after covering a couple hundred miles on foot. Or some of the boys have been known to sit up all night just wondering what would make a guy in his right mind take a shot of heroin. Hmm. Up early? No, I just stayed out late. What have we got there? Oh, snapshots from Bowman's locker. It's nothing. Tell me one thing, Anderson. Why do you work at night? Why is duck hunting better in the rain? Maybe you're right. Anything on Miss Bonds, girl? No, there's nothing in the files. She's never been booked any place. Only one thing looked a little funny. She registered over at Eastern High School as 18. And she registered again at Central at 17. Well, she's 17, all right. I checked her out yesterday. Mother deceased, 1942, lives with her father. He's disabled, got hung up in an accident, 1951. Draws nominal pension, spends most of it keeping her in school. I guess the kids left pretty much on her own. Well, that sounds pretty much like standard formula, all right. You got a message here on a telephone call came in a while ago. Who's from? Mrs. Bowman. Oh, that's all right with me. I'd like to talk to Mrs. Bowman again anyway. I'm so glad you came. I've been very worried. I understand. Maybe I can help you. I fixed some coffee. Well, uh, two creams, no sugar. 
Is it really as much of a problem as you said it was on the phone this morning? I'm afraid it is. I thought maybe it was just a local thing. No, you see, the stigma attached to the subject of narcotics makes it impossible to approach the public on the matter. Thank you. Plus, there's a widespread school of thought based on the ostrich theory. Oh, head in the sand. What you don't know won't hurt you. But that's silly. I think so. But then, I'm not the commissioner or the public. Doesn't that put an added strain on the law enforcement group? Well, not necessarily. Salon sometimes has its advantages. We don't want to frighten away our fish. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk with you. Raymond had a friend that used to come and see him. Sometimes in the middle of the night. He never came inside. Raymond used to go out and sit in the car with him. What kind of a car did he drive? Oh, I can't tell one car from another. Besides, I didn't pay much attention to it at the time. You see, Raymond belonged to a boys' club, and I thought it was one of them. I did ask him about it once, though. He didn't say much, except that this boy's name was Jimmy. Anderson, wake up. What's up? What's happening? Where's Ames' other phone number? I've got to get a hold of Raymond. I've got it right here in my wallet someplace. This guy, Jimmy, is up to his ears on this Bowman case. Self-injected or no self-injected, I'm going to find a way to get him. Yeah. If I have to use, no visible means of support. What brought this on? Why don't you work in the daytime so that you can sleep at night? Murder brought it on. The Bowman, Raymond Bowman. He was murdered. He was killed. I can't find his phone number. Oh, some detective. You better go find her. Today's her day off. That's what I just said. Go find her and tell her to find Regan. And tell her to call me on the double. Just like television, huh? Except we never arrest anyone. And you better get some sleep, because it's going to be very busy around here tonight. Pick up the rest for questioning. Give us about ten minutes. Checking. 
I brought a friend with me. So? I don't see him any place. I guess maybe he's a little brought down. You mean put down? <laughs> Come on, type. Since it's your pad, I guess maybe you can meet him. All right, already. Let's meet him. Bert, this is Dick. Hi. Nice place. good i i think i need a little fresh air come on julie well the guys are square uh get in or out Take a little ride down the station. There's a few questions I want to ask you. What's the matter? Am I in trouble? You know the answer to that, son. You tell me. What do you want to know? How big is your habit? About four kids. Sometimes five? Yeah. All right, son. You've heard what your friends had to say. Now, what were you doing at that party? Bert, that's the fellow that lives there, invited this girl that I know, and she asked me. Julie Vaughn? Yes, sir. Were you aware that narcotics changed hands at that party? No, sir. Who else did you know there? Well, no one. Oh, I'd seen some of them around, you know, down at the drive-in or someplace. Time to your parents expect you home. It's quarter of one. Well, I ought to be there now. No, it'll just be a few minutes more. Let's go talk to your girlfriend. Julie, here? Let's step in here. Do you know this lad? What did he tell you? He doesn't know anything about me. Do you think that's the right attitude? How do you expect me to act when you grab me out in front of my house in the middle of the night? You can't do that. I didn't do anything. You just came from a party on East Elm Street, didn't you? Yes. I was going home. We've got a complaint. We could hold you for disturbing the peace. And another thing, young lady. We happen to have a curfew in this town left over from the last war. This might be a good time to resurrect it. Yes, sir. In the first place, Dick Williams here didn't say anything about you. Matter of fact, he didn't even know you were here, right? That's right. You don't even know why you're here, and already you're complaining. People that act like that usually have something to hide. Did you ever hear a saying, birds of a feather? Do you happen to have a boyfriend named Jimmy? I know a boy named Jimmy. Have you ever read the Bible? What? There's a saying, ye shall be judged by the company ye shall keep. I suppose in your crowd they'd say if you lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas. What do you mean? I mean, until you prove differently, we're going to consider you're in the middle of this mess. And if you don't change a few of your ideas as well as your companions, you're going to find yourself in a lot of trouble. All right, I'm going to take a chance on you and let you go home. But remember, you make a fool out of me, and we have doors around here that only open from the outside. All right, son, you can go home now. We'll take the girl on home. Mr. Lacey, 
If you don't mind, I'd appreciate it if I could take Julie home. All right, son. You take her home. This report on the Bowman case. Oh, thanks a lot, Chief. How long did you know Ray Bowman? I told you. Three months, maybe four. Who was his contact? Oh, I don't dig. I said, who was his pusher? Where'd he get his age? Some uptown junkie, man. I don't know. How much did he shoot? Yeah, four cash. You know, this doesn't sound like it'd be very much fun to me. What happened the first time you tried taking him? I got sick. Yeah, but then what? Everybody laughed. Did that make you feel like a big shot? No. What do you mean you got sick? I got sick to my stomach. How much did that cost you? Nothing. This guy gave me some. He was a real friend. You lied to us, boy. You've got a six to eight cap habit. We figure you're a peddler because that's the only way you could score. Now we think that you gave strict nine to Ray Bowman. Sometimes heroin works on our side when we arrest an addict or bust a junkie, as they call it. The narcotic squad is one branch of police work where time is in our favor. Just cut off the supply and wait. It's as simple as that. An addict lives by the clock. Ours are his enemies. He lives from shot to shot. His whole existence depends upon his next injection. Each minute that ticks away brings him closer to the time when his enslaved body will demand another ever-increasing shot of heroin. Detoxification or withdrawal of drugs from an addict is excruciatingly painful, and the mental anguish is as horrible as the physical agony. About 12 hours after the addict has taken his last shot, the withdrawal symptoms begin. He is racked with muscle spasms and often feels unbearable pain at the slightest touch. He breaks into perspiration, vomits and gags constantly, and suffers severe intestinal and stomach pain. His leg muscles not uncontrollably. The addict must suffer this torment, which will last about 10 days. But there are only two things known to science that can give him relief. Death or heroin. While operators continue their 24-hour observation of all suspects, a relentless search goes on to compile evidence against the prisoner. Since it is impossible under the existing laws to hold an addict without positive proof of possession, an extensive search of the suspect's property is made in an effort to produce conclusive evidence. Narcotics are often discovered concealed behind headlights, under floorboards, in spare tires, inside hubcaps, in the upholstery, and even in the radiator. Searching a suspect's living quarters is a little more difficult. You can hide drugs almost anywhere. For instance, our lab has to check tooth powder, foot powder, talcum powder, soap powder, sleeping powder, aspirins, and so forth. On the other hand, packets of the junk could be anywhere, taped up under the sink or cleverly concealed in a hollow doorknob. Meanwhile, the suspect himself is questioned and re-questioned in an effort to pinpoint names and locations of pushers and supply dealers. Many times, the narcotic squad receives valuable assistance and information from other police units. On Monday afternoon, September 15th, a motor officer of the city police became suspicious of a vehicle circling a junior high school in excess of the 15-mile speed limit. Although he was critically injured, the officer managed to record the license of the pursued vehicle. When it was discovered that the license number was the same as the one on the car driven by the man seen with Julie Barnes, our office was notified, and we were called in to assist the regular police with the arrest. Under prolonged questioning and the strain of being withheld from drugs, 
the addict has named the suspected pusher and has agreed to assist Agent Anderson in a setup buy. <laughs> Maybe you got twisted. No, man. I've been sick. I couldn't score. Well, no credit here. Like I made it. You got the goal? This way out, a friend of mine wants to get high. We're going to shoot up at his pad. This guy okay? Sure. Just a joy popper. Dig. Tea head. Lush, no habit. Okay, I'll take a look at his arm. No mainliner, man. This guy's a schmecker. Peter's scare me. Don't come on that way, man. Like I know this guy. He's hip. All right, I'll talk to him. Where is he? Your friend here tells me you've been sick. No, he didn't tell you that. He's the one that's sick. I got the money. This guy's sort of hard to get along with, ain't he? No, I'm not hard to get along with. I've got the guilt. Either you can make the scene or you can't. You better give me that dough now. I want to look at it in the light. That's the way I do business. is arrested, or burned down as they call it, several things happen. Within a few hours, the news travels along the grapevine of junkies, and the other pushers panic or pack in. With the supply suddenly diminished, the price of a fix is doubled or tripled. Soon the pain-crazed, dope-starved addicts will take desperate steps to procure their needed drugs. 
There is no terror like the plight of an addict who is deprived of his drugs. He will sell anything he owns. He will steal, cheat, lie, do anything for one shot of heroin. Sooner or later, almost without exception, the narcotics victim will turn to crime to finance his habit. For our records show that dope addiction is definitely one of the most expensive methods of committing suicide. You know the service station man closes up at 10. I know. Yeah, but how do you know? You never come down here. Never mind, I got ways. Hey. You just turn the sign off. Start it up and drive by once slow. That's clear to me. Okay. Drive on in then. gas can. I'll make it inside like I'm going to pay for it. If it's not cool, whistle or something. Okay. Joel, or don't you? Yeah, but... Yeah, but nothing. My legs are killing me, man. i got to have a fix. What good's the money? Everybody's closed up tight. Like maybe Jimmy didn't get twisted. Like maybe he got a panic and played it cool, man. No, he made the freezer. Casey was working bar when they put him down. Don't bug me, man. You come on like Jimmy got burned down. I don't have a clue, but don't put it down, because i got to have a fix. I do, too, but I ain't that sick yet. Thought you said you weren't getting hooked. Why did you shoot him? He wanted the same thing. And shut up. The station owner's call was received at police headquarters. Within seconds, alert calls went out to all mobile units. Within 15 minutes, a patrol car cruising in an outlying residential area spotted an auto that fitted the description. Car! Turn out your lights. Put 
begin to turn. It must have turned over. I'm going to stop. Keep going. radio enabled narcotics men to follow the pursuing police car. It was within a matter of minutes after the chase ended that our men arrived upon the scene. I picked this up. The grip on the butt is cracked off. It must have been the impact. Threw one of the kids right through the roof of Sedan 2. It's too hot to get here to find out much. The 38 got caught on the phone booth. This may be the answer. But check it against the slug we've got down to ballistic. If it matches, at least we'll know who got caught. A lot of good that'll do. Come on, let's go. in front of the third precinct in ten minutes. Here, take it quick. Boy, why doesn't somebody make a paper cup that doesn't fall apart in your hand? Where's the cream? I thought you said sugar. I always use cream. You're not supposed to put coffee in the paraffin kind. They're for cold drinks. I don't know these things. Why don't you tell the guy down at the drugstore? You seen anybody yet? Nothing yet. Sure, wish there was some cream in this. So do I. It wouldn't have been so hot. So, how did this kid give you guys the slip? He went in the bathroom down at juvenile division and climbed out a window. Who was supposed to be watching? I was. Uh, if this kid gets away, there goes our case. Well, so what makes you think he's going to be wandering around down here in the middle of the night? Because the first thing he'd be looking for is another shot of heroin. How do you know? He's got the shakes, hasn't he? Oh, come on, Lady. Anderson, Peter. how long have you been in this department? Two years, five months, and 11 days. Well, by this time, somebody should have told you the most likely cure for the drug habit is to leave it alone in the first place. Yeah, but this kid this is a kid. This kid is a heroin addict. Hello, Lacey. Hello, Lacey. Unit 4. This is Regan, Unit 1. Lacey, go ahead. That 50 Chrysler that circled the block earlier just parked on Central. The guy ought to be coming around your corner on foot about now. He's by himself. It's all yours. And guess what? Just like you said, the kid that gave us the slip. Wouldn't you not? Screaming his gets off for 10 days, and the first place he heads for is here. You know, Lacey, sometimes I don't think there is a cure. There he is. I'll get him. Okay, Regan. Anderson is after the kid on foot. You take the car and head him off at the end of the street. Thank you. 
one blessed thing I can do unless we have more time. No, I've already talked to the DA. Some big shot is paying for Jimmy Melton's attorney, so they moved the trial up. Sure, you know it and I know it. But what are we going to do for facts? That's right, nothing. Okay. There's nothing you can do? Not without evidence. The disgusting thing is that this Jimmy is just a small-time operator. If we can't even convict a punk like that, how are we supposed to get to the higher-ups? Personally, I'm reasonably sure he killed the Bowman boy. But when you come right down to it, Mr. Lacey, Bowman took that shot himself. That's it, Becky. That's just it. One of my boys just had a first-class funeral. And we've got the gun that did it. And the kid that killed him, he's dead. This thing is going on all over this country. What are we going to do about it? Well... For one thing, and this may seem pretty insignificant to you right now, we're already doing something about it. Some of our students realized the importance of this problem, and they formed a committee. As a matter of fact, Dick Williams and Julie Barnes came down here with me. They want to talk to you. Send the kids in. Hello, Mr. Lacey. You've got a minute. We'd like to talk to you. Sure. Well, I've been elected head of student council for this semester. And as a civil project, we've decided to start a student investigating committee with Coach Bedker as faculty advisor. So I've appointed Julie here as my assistant. Oh, that's fine. I'm glad to hear it. We were wondering if we could count on you to give a brief discussion at our student faculty meeting. Sure. You call me later in the week. Oh, and one more thing, Mr. Lacey. Julie has something that she wants to tell you. Well, Dick says it's important, but it's probably nothing. Well, sure it's important, Julie. You know what the coach said. Well, all it is is that Jimmy had a gun under the seat of the car one night. When he stepped on the brakes, it slipped up under my feet. I didn't know it was a gun until I reached down and picked it up. Then what? Nothing. He got mad and told me to put it back under the seat and keep my mouth shut. What kind of a gun? I don't know. Just a gun. The handle was broken, though, and it didn't look very new. Just a minute. What do you mean, broken handle? Well, you know, one of the pieces on the side of the handle was broken in half. Anyway, it didn't belong to Jimmy. He borrowed it from Don Rigos. That's the boy that got killed in the car wreck after he shot Ross Hart down at the gas station. Is this the gun? Yes. Yes, it is. That's the one. Now, wait a minute. I'm going to make a phone call, and then I want you to go with me. This gun killed a policeman. Lacey, give me the DA. Mr. Murphy, Lacey, you know the guy we've got down there on the federal drug violation? Yeah. Well, you can go ahead and make it the state versus Jimmy Melton and the charge is first degree murder. That's right. We've got a witness that's willing to testify. No, not on the Bowman case. 
We're going to prove that he killed Carter in the phone booth. We have a young lady here that's just taken a big step in the right direction. James Milton was found guilty of the murder of narcotics officer Edwin Carter. He was sentenced in accordance with the law for this crime. On October the 4th, the file on Edwin Carter, police officer, was officially closed. But our story does not end here. Every day, more chapters are being enacted in our city. More names are being added to the long list of victims, uninformed of the consequences, and hopelessly ensnared in the web of addiction. Not until the last narcotics trafficker has paid his debt to society will the work of your narcotics squad be finished. As long as one innocent person, man, woman, or child, is exposed to the horror of dope enslavement, a silent killer works in our midst, and the end of this story will remain yet to be written. Thank you.